Hello, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Jump, and my my co-host Wendy Perry. Today we have a special guest. His name is Michael Allen, uh, and he is the founder of P A S O. And I am going to have Wendy give you a little introduction about who he is and what is P A S O. All right. Well, let me tell you guys a little bit about Michael Allen. Michael um, was an alienated dad, and he fought a 10-month interstate custody battle between Montana and Arizona, and he successfully brought his child back to his home state, and now they are able to successfully co-parent, which is wonderful news that we're always so happy to hear and his child is now thriving and Michael trained to be a high conflict divorce coach and he helps parents overcome the dynamic of parental alienation so he is a reunification coach and he began advocating in September 2015 and I'm going to have him tell us a little more about that, you know, what motivated him and inspired him to become a parental alienation advocate and to work in the area of reunifications. Um, he also is the founder of PASO, P-A-S-O, which stands for Parental Alienation Solutions Organization. And it is a means to connect local parents in their area. And their mission is to protect all children from all forms of abuse at all times. And I know that one of the missions of PASO is to form in-person support group meetings around the world. And they are doing that. Um, they've got a chapter in every state in the United States. And they've got um, chapters in other countries. So we're going to talk a little more about that, why... Um, it's a passion of Michael's and why he thinks it's important to have support group meetings um, available to to everyone around the world. So, Michael, welcome to Custody Matters Live. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Danica. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so tell um, us a little bit, tell us a little bit about what Wendy didn't say. Maybe fill in the blanks for us. Yeah, she covered a lot of ground there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, back in, um, I'd say it was, um, 2015, I, um, I first asked my, uh, my then wife for, for divorce and, um, you know, just knowing what we know today, it, um, uh, the day after the divorce, she, um, took my son and her and granddaughter, Shikasia, and, uh, left the state and, um, she, uh, before I could do anything. So, um, she then went to Montana and filed a, what we know as the silver bullet now, um, filed a, a false restraining order accusing me of domestic violence. And, you know, I didn't know what to do. Um, there was a, first thing of course I did was I called the police, as most of us do when something like this happens, you know, we're, we're kind of spinning, we don't know what's going on. And um, the police officer said something to me back then that kind of really, shifted the way I thought was the first thing I heard was he looks at me and goes, well, um, you know, you guys are still legally married. Uh, she might as well be taking them to Disneyland. There's nothing you can do. And that really resonated with me. There's nothing you can do. So that didn't sit right with me. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't like the idea that there was nothing I could do. So, you know, I started to process this, and I didn't know what was going on still. And my sister, who had um, also talked to the police, and she, she, mentioned, she said something that uh, really stuck with me was, uh, she said, um, I think my brother's being alienated. Mm. So that right there, I'd never heard that word before. And that, fortunately, that was the same day. You know, and that kind of started making me process. So I started Googling what, what is alienation. And I found, uh, some of you might know Keith Marsalik, Mm -hmm. I found his group, uh, Parental Alienation Worldwide Support Group, and I joined that, and I started reading through it, and I'm trying to absorb all the information I can, and uh, that's when I realized, holy crap, all these are my story. This is what's been going on. Um, I got to do something about this, and all the while, this is this nothing you can do, this negative narrative from the police officer sticking in my head, and I refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe there's nothing I could do, and that's when I, you know, I'd been involved in AA. I'd had a drinking problem in my past and um, even up to, up to and leading to the, the divorce, you know, that was 
what was part of the problems that we were having. And the, um, I wanted the concept of AA to come to Paso. So we came, I met with my, um, I had a good friend back in Sal de Guardia, Wendy knows him. Mm-hmm. Um, he was uh, an amazing support throughout this whole process. And without his knowledge and expertise, I don't know if I could have, and him helping stabilize me, I don't know if I could have been successful like I am today. So I knew that we needed other people around us, some other veterans, people that knew what were going, what was going on to help guide newcomers. Back then I knew I was a newcomer. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what was going on. I needed veterans. And I knew that concept needed to come to our world and form, you know, bonds. Now support groups have gotten kind of a negative stereotype. You know, they, people go there and spin and it happens. It happens a lot. I did the, I started that group. It started February. The first meeting started February, 2016. Um, Again, that was September 30th, 2015 that my wife took off. So I used those groups to help stabilize me. And not only that, I was giving back to other parents that are doing that. I was trying to, um, granted, pick their brains, but I also knew that they needed support too because I myself, I work in mental health. I'm a behavioral health technician. I've uh, been a clinical coordinator and I, I work, I've worked in the field for a really long time. Um, so I've, uh, I knew that other people need to support as well, no matter what, this is mm-hmm. trauma. This is all trauma based. So mm-hmm. that was really what started Paso was this, that needing for support. I'd seen Wendy's stuff too. And I was like, as I'm going through Keith's group, I'd seen Wendy in there. I saw what she was doing with the groups. And I kind of wanted to marry those two concepts to mm-hmm. bring together everyone. So the, the, the mission really was, was to bring everyone to have uh, a juggernaut of meetings like AA does for, Paso or for anyone that wants to do it. So, well, I think you, um, Michael, I was going to say, I think you touched on something really important. You talked about, um, how some, sometimes support group meetings get a bad rap and, and, and people tend to see it as, um, hurting more than helping. Right. But I think that it's so important that you, recognized and addressed that and and I know that you have because I've participated in um, when you train your group leaders Um, it's really important for anyone who wants to host and facilitate support group meetings um, that they understand that a support group meeting needs to be a lot more than just um, having people commiserate you really have to have um, first of all you need to have structure you can't just have people come in and just um, commiserate and then they leave feeling worse than when they came in. You need to have structure and you, you need to have um, a, a format that ends in a way that is going to make them leave feeling better than when they came in, feeling more encouraged and empowered. And I know that that's something that the structure of PASO does. And if you don't mind, tell our viewers a little more about that, about that you do train, you have a training that you do for people who facilitate your PASO support group meetings. Right. And this is something I do completely separate. As you mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm also a high conflict divorce coach. Mm-hmm. So um, that is separate from, from PASO completely. PASO is kind of a personal um passion of mine obviously because Mm -hmm. I know it's it's a needed thing and people you know can't always afford to um, hire a coach or hire attorney they've been through the ringer so this was kind of a a means to help people right now so you know if you you know you can't afford my services that's that's okay you know here's a service you can utilize when you're ready you're still spinning that's okay here's a service so I've always I put together a packet and I'm always willing to send that out for free to anybody it's, it gives it some structure, which is really what's needed. You, the, the, um, the thing is, is structure, boundaries, obviously, because you're going to attract sick people as well, because there's mm-hmm. not everyone here as well. Like most of us aren't well, right? <laughs> we're, all, we're all struggling with trauma on some level. But so, you, model it, you model it after like AA. I mean, you had experience with AA. So, mm-hmm. um, and they've done a very successful job of actually... Um, having different kinds of support group meetings. Um, right. And, yeah. and it is, and I do, I want to try and re- remove that 
stigma out of it because I model it after A, but there's a lot of things I, I don't agree with in it too, which is like, you know, if you're an alcoholic, you've got to consider yourself an alcoholic. I've got to like, I want to help expand that mindset into not such a, you know, kind of a, a victim mentality is where we tend to get stuck a lot of the, mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Um, these meetings are meant to be productive. They're meant to pull people forward and lead them to coaching if they need it, because people, I don't think people understand the benefits of, of true coaching. And I think that every targeted parent has a gift. They just haven't unlocked it yet. So, you know, when they're ready to come to me, they're ready to come to me. But in the meantime, here's that free resource. If you're a leader, you're willing to start a group, I'll point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I, I, like I said, I, I participated in one of your, um, training for your coaches and I was, and I was so impressed. I mean, you guys really, it's really a great, it's a great training to go through, you know, if, if you want to get involved in hosting support group meetings and, you know, I did that for many years and it's, it's very rewarding. I mean, I think when you have a group of people come and they, you can see that they're, they're starting to feel better. They're starting to feel understood and it, they feel like they've got a family in the room. You know, they're with people who understand what they're going through. Um, you really leave feeling, feeling uplifted and it's a really, really, like I said, very rewarding thing to do. I think, um, right. you, you did say that you work in mental health. Um, mm-hmm. so are, do you work in substance abuse? Is that what you work in? No, or, but I deal with it a lot. I, okay. I work with the, I work with the, what we have in Arizona called the SMI mm-hmm. population, which is called consider it's, it's a horrible, another horrible label, but it stands for seriously mentally ill. Mm. So I tend to work with the, um, schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, um, mood disorders, um, personality disorders, which we're all familiar with, Mm -hmm. but all of it's based in trauma. So what I've learned through this is I work in trauma informed care agency. Um, what I've learned is that 90% of all mental illness is childhood trauma. So interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not a lot of people know that it's 90% of all mental illness is rooted in childhood trauma. So that goes for the personality disorders that goes for everything. I that's, and that's, what's given me the perspective I have. Um, you know, I don't hate my ex. I'd never, I, well, of course I did for a little while during the beginning, <laughs> but you know, we all do, we all go through that phase, but it, it really gives me an opportunity to look at people struggling with any type of mental illness as um, someone who's gone through trauma. Mm-hmm. So it gives me a, a bit of a softer perspective to look at them and, you know, go, it makes me think, I think more along the lines of, you know, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? Mm, wow. You know? Yeah, I can imagine, I'm, you know, um, it, when things get so horribly wrong, where, where you've got a parent that's just viciously, competitively uh, going after the other to do whatever it takes, whatever, you know, at, at any cost, there's definitely something behind that. Maybe the little five-year-old in them that had them do what they do. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, and I'll even, I'll even coach people I know that are struggling with their own issues because I know they may be a part of the problem. I may, I'll coach anybody that wants help. So my goal is to help people become a better parent. Um, so. Well, I have a question for you. And it might be too personal. You might say, yeah, I don't want to, I I don't want to go there, but I'm always so um, curious and also really, (laughs) you know, (laughs) uh, I feel hopeful when I hear that someone is successfully um, Mm co-parenting after there has been parental alienation. And you said that you and um, your ex-spouse, you successfully co-parent now. So Mm -hmm. if you don't mind, uh, what does that mean? Like, are, I mean, are you able to pick up the phone and call her and chat with her? Or is it like, you know, our family wizard and it's like a very carefully crafted email and you know what I mean? Like, like, no, t- tell me, question. I really, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Okay. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it, it actually used to be like that, right? I had to carefully craft every email, every e- ask Sal, if you ever talked to him, I had to probably run. <laughs> every email passed him because I would overthink it. I would dissect it 10 million times before I wanted to 
hit send because, oh, I don't want to get the wrong reaction. You know, it was, it was just like I could have used our family wizard back then. Um, it was horrible. And I'll never forget that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it was, it took time. It took a lot of time. But eventually, it had to, I had to switch my mindset. So as the healthier parent, you have to, the, this is what I always want to try to teach people is they have to be the one that's going to make those, that decision to be able to co-parent. Um, one thing I really learned from, from Dorsey Pruder, who trained me, was it only takes one person to consciously co-parent. I absolutely mm-hmm. believe that. Um, you know, I've got to give her credit, too, for all the great training she's given me because it, um, it helped shift me out of that victim mindset into, okay, I'm the healthier parent. How am I going to do this for my son? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So the best way I could describe it was energetically I had to every ounce of hate that was thrown at me through my son, through, through email, through text, whatever. Um, I had to energetically throw back 10 times as much love and it wasn't love for her. Right. I was picturing my son behind her and all that love I had for my son was going to go through her, you know, whether she wanted it or not, (laughs) I'm, she's, um, I'm going, she's going to throw hate at me. She's going to say something nasty. It's going to come through my son, whatever. Um, the best example I can give to you, this is, and this is what really was for, for me really important was, um, I had one back, like my son was eventually ordered back to Arizona. It all, it all eventually came out the way it was supposed to. And I'm very, very fortunate for that. I'm give, you know, God, my friends, family, all the credit for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd gotten him back. His mom was still in Montana. She was getting ready to move back here, but he was ordered to stay in Arizona. Um, so I had him for a period of time where I was able to kind of deprogram him from some of that negativity and awfulness. And I was still going through the training with Dorsey back then and um, still learning this stuff. Mm-hmm. But we're leaving the grocery store together and he looks at my car and he looks at me, looks at my car and I could feel something coming, but you know, mm-hmm. um, he looks at the car and he goes, you know, daddy, mommy says she bought you that car and she can take it from you whenever she wants. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. And I felt that, mm, but mm-hmm. I, I caught it right away. I caught it right away. This was how I was, I knew I was getting better. It was, um, I caught it, pushed it back down and, you know, he like bared down, like he was ready for like something bad to happen. Cause I think he knew what he was saying. He was, it was a poke, poke at me through, mm-hmm. through his mom. And um, I caught myself, brought myself back down. And then I I looked at him and I said, Brandon, what is that? Teaching him critical thinking skills, right? I'm teaching him how to think for himself. And he thinks for a second. He goes, grown up stuff. He was about six, seven at the time. And uh, I go, right, it's grown up stuff. And then I immediately switched it around. I said, you know, I looked at the store behind us and I go, Brandon, you know what I love about your mom? I go, she taught me how to use coupons and I just saved a whole bunch of money in that grocery store because of what she taught me how to use coupons. Mm-hmm. And I saw all this pressure come off of him. Wow. He, he smiled, he hugged my leg and he said, I love you, dad. Oh, awesome. You know, yeah. that it's so easy. It's so more, should I say it's, it's difficult to resist the urge to set the record straight Mm-hmm. Um, to defend, um, to, you know, when, when they sucker punch you through the children, it's so easy to deflect it right in the presence of the children. And, mm-hmm. and, um, and yet you're right. I mean, you taking the higher road, turning something negative that was meant to be, to, to hurt you, you know, mm-hmm. through the child, um, you're able to turn it around and it actually has, you end up looking better in uh, in the child's eyes because the child is like, oh wow, you know, um, when these things are said to him, he he didn't react in a negative way. He just just you know just let it roll off and actually turned it into some to a positive conversation. Yeah, it so, helps just it helps disprove the narrative. Like you you know you're mm-hmm. you're painted out to be this monster. And your child eventually sees it. You know, you you're you just want to be the exact opposite of whatever they painted you out to be. That, that was such an awesome example, and 
I know a lot of our viewers right now are like, oh my gosh, that is so great. And that's the kind of thing that I think that's getting examples like that is why it's important to connect with other people. Whether you have a coach or you go to support group meetings or both, I happen to think they complement each other. You know, it's not one or the other, but just, you know, getting information like that can really, really make a difference in somebody's situation. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, I know you helped to initiate and shape or, or possibly help write a little bit of four parental alienation bills in Arizona, mm -hmm. in the legislature, um, back in 2016. And we, we hear this a lot in our circles, you know, we need to write a bill, we need to have legislation. Um, so you actually did that. So tell us a little bit about that experience and, and what did you learn from it and what are your thoughts on that now, if you would? Well, yeah, that was certainly an experience. Um, um, it's, it's just funny how the universe works because it was just um, complete divine intervention. Um, you know, just by being an involved parent back then, um, I'd taken my ex-wife's granddaughter to a Capitol meeting and I'd you know, where they toured the Capitol and stuff. And I got a business card at one of the, um, um, what's this called? The representatives, House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at one point in my lowest point, I'm like wondering how am I going to affect change? I know we need some changes in the legislature. And I asked God for help at that time. And I just happened to reach into my jacket and pull out his card. This was two years later. Mm -hmm. And I shot an email to him. Guy was surprisingly open. And we just, I just started building connections. One of my, one of my strengths is, you know, helping connect with people and helping build connections. And, um, Sal was one of my go-to guys for that. And he was experienced with legislator and he'd worked with uh, representative David Schweikert before and helped me polish my speech and helped. We, we connected with other members of local David Alger, people who were already doing this kind of stuff. And, um, so we, we came up with some bills. We, we wrote a bill for, uh, with Dr. Childress language in it. Mm -hmm. um, we wrote run to, you know, try to punish, actually prosecute false allegations. Um, it was four bills, I believe. I can't remember them all right now. It was back in 2016. Um, but the best, the, I don't know what happened with it. I think one, one speaker wound up squashing them all. Mm -hmm. But the, the biggest advice I have is, through those support groups was to connect people, right? So, you know, your legislators are there to help you, but everyone's doing their own thing. So I always wanted to bring people together through those groups so that they could speak with one voice. And that's the biggest thing that legislators need is more people behind it. I've always likened gathering targeted parents as like herding wet cats with a noodle. <laughs> you know, everybody's spinning or everybody's over here, over there. Oh, we got to do this. We got to do that. Everyone's got to speak with one united voice. This is how mm -hmm. social change comes about, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, I, I encourage people to use those Paso groups to connect in your local areas. There's a Paso Delaware. There's a Paso. Um, the only one we don't have is Paso, Texas. And we did that out of respect for what you were doing out, out in Texas, Wendy. So, Aww. um, <laughs> <laughs> Aww. so, sweet. but uh, we have one in every state, but Texas. Um, so I encourage people to use those groups to connect to people because that's what your legislators need is numbers. We, I collected parent stories. I printed up the pictures of them and their kids at the front. You know, it was very powerful stuff, but, and I don't say it's a waste of time because the most mm -hmm. more people do this, the more people are eventually going to start to listen. You never know when that one person is going to get, yeah, we, we need this. You're going to get a legislator that's been through this, you know, um, yeah. they just don't know what's happening to them. So it's to me it's our job to help educate the the public and every targeted parent has that unique gift to connect with someone else that can that's been through this absolutely and and I, and I agree with you I, it's, it's not a waste of time even if um you work on a bill and the bill does not pass um you have surely educated a lot of people along the way and made a lot of really important connections and when you network and you connect with people, it's like that business card in your pocket. You never know yeah. when 
that connection is going to be like, aha, that's why I met that person a couple of years ago and put that card in my pocket. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's just connecting with people is so incredibly important um, for what we do to create awareness and education. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I'll give you one, one more example was I went to, I don't know if you guys know in Arizona, I want to say about a year ago, year and a half ago, a, a gentleman shot up everyone that was involved in his divorce case. He killed many people, psychologists, um, I can't remember the specifics of it, but there was a meeting here for mental health professionals, everyone that wanted to talk about this issue. And since I worked in mental health, I was able to get into that meeting. And I met one of the psychologists that's kind of, she's a bigger deal here in Arizona. And um, I just happened to turn around her and I gave her my coach. I was a coach by then. I gave her my card and I said, do you ever need anyone to talk about this? Let me know. And she's been referring me clients that she and I was shocked that it was her because I didn't think I broke through at all to her, but she's actually been following us and following our work. So it's awesome. I mean, well, I, I do want to um, thank you for the support you've shown me over the years. You did come to uh, the parental alienation symposium here in Dallas in 2017. And so did Keith that you mentioned. And so did Sal and uh, Dr. Childress was our keynote speaker, and it was really just great to have all of you here. It was, wow, it was, it was, it was a pretty awesome weekend. <laughs> it was. Um, it was yeah, weekend. but um, you, you just do so much, and I, and I think that um, you're very inspiring, you know, and really, really, if people are thinking about getting involved, especially in the area of support groups, they should definitely connect with you, and they can um, connect with you. Uh, your website is michaelallencoaching.com. And then uh, if they're looking for PASO on Facebook, um, they put in P-A-S-O dash W-W. And that stands for PASO dash worldwide. And then once they're in there, then you can direct them to their state. Or um, I think maybe a few of the states have got a couple of chapters within the state. So, so they, right. yeah. So Anybody can, anybody can, instead of the WW, they can put in their state code. So it started out with Paso AZ, obviously, Paso, Arizona. But if they want to put in their state code, it's more likely as a Paso there that they can utilize as a platform. Um, just, and the other countries, too. There's Croatia. There's Great Britain. GBR. Use the country code. Um, GBR. Paso GBR. Um, South Africa. Uh, I think that one's ZAF. Paso ZAF. There's Trinidad and Tobago. Um, which is, I'm half Trinidadian, so that's always a special <laughs> passion of mine. Um, so yeah, it's 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 out there. It's just we've got to connect everyone to speak in one united voice, and that's how these bills mm -hmm. are going to get the passes. Oh, I thought of something I want to mention. Speaking yeah. of being united and support groups, and and we do support each other's efforts. Um, if anybody joins my members only community, my membership community, and if they're in a Paso group. I've got a promo code box at the bottom of the membership application. And if they put PASO in, and then I can confirm that they're in one of your PASO groups, then I donate $10 per person to PASO. So I just want to put that out there. Awesome. Well, I mean, every little bit helps. And I know when you do, um, you know, what you do, I mean, you've got expenses. You've got, you know, materials. And I've seen your materials. You guys are very, like I said, structured and organized. You've got materials. And printing costs and things like that. So um, I just want to let people know that we do support each other in that way. Very good. Well, our time is wrapping up fast, fast and furious. Is there anything else? Um, like you want to take 30 seconds, Michael, to share anything else about um, to our viewers? Yeah. If I'd say I give the, you know, the biggest piece of advice to anyone out there uh, is Heal your own trauma. Um, you're the healthier parent. Uh, you have the ability to heal your trauma because your ex may or may not, more than likely not, but I always want to say there's always hope. There's always hope. If, there's, if, if mine can do it, anybody can do it. And that's why I always, when everyone says there's, there's no, no narcissist or no borderline ever changes, I don't, I don't believe that. Um, so heal your own trauma. There's all kinds of work out there. You can do EMDR. Stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. It's huge for, for trauma. Or hypnosis is huge. It's been, I still do that. It's it's amazing. I've got a great hypnosis guy that also works worldwide if anyone ever wants to reach out to me about that. 
um, heal your own trauma because you're the only one that's probably going to do it. And that's why you're going to be the stable, healthy parent for your child to return to. Absolutely. I, I, you, that's a very, very good point. Because if you're constantly looking to them of, you know, they're broken, they're wrong. Well, you know what, you, um, the only thing you can do is, is to fix yourself and make yourself strong. So yeah, definitely. Okay, Wendy, um, would you like to give us our close for today? Yes, I would. Just want to remind everyone that parental alienation can happen to anyone, so it should matter to everyone. And please join us in our mission to educate everyone about parental alienation. Awesome. Okay, see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.